A newlywed couple, days after complaining about a creepy man camping at the campsite next to theirs, went missing. That was until their good friends stumbled across their bodies. Kylan Schulte was born in September of 1996. Four years later, her brother was born. She attended high school in Billings, Montana, where she was part of the 2014 graduation class. She even worked part-time as a welder while she went to school. Upon graduating, she got more and more into what people would call the hippie lifestyle. However, her life wouldn't be as carefree as she would like. Kylan was stuck in an abusive relationship. On top of that, she would lose her brother. In 2015, when he was 15 years old, he was shot after tapping on the window of a friend at 2.30 a.m., having been believed to have been an intruder. Kylan became depressed. The drastic change in her personality was evident to those around her. Feeling it was time for a change, Kylan's father suggested that the two start over and move out to a small town called Moab in Utah. In 2019, Kylan bumped into a woman named Crystal Turner while hiking in the mountains. The two instantly hit it off, falling pretty hard for each other. Crystal had also just recently moved to town herself. They had a lot in common, with both of them enjoying hiking, camping, and fishing. Kylan slowly started coming back to life. Living in a new town with new faces, having a new girlfriend, and really diving into her hobbies had brought her back into being the cheerful person she once was. In April of 2021, Kylan Schulte, now 24 years old, and her girlfriend, Crystal Turner, now 38, moved in together and eventually got married after having been together for two years. Both of their families were very happy to see the two together and to see how happy they seemed. Crystal's mother said, Oh yes, they were both so happy. They were just ecstatic. <laughs> it was the most beautiful wedding I've seen. They worked at a food co-op together, while Crystal also worked at a local McDonald's. Their friends and co-workers said that they were always a joy to work with. The two would often spend their downtime camping, often spending a lot of time in nature with their pet rabbit. While doing so, they would frequent a local bar called Woody's Tavern in the town of Moab. The two were often seen laughing, smiling, and just having a good time with friends while pounding down the drinks. The two women were, notably, more focused on each other more than anyone else, according to friends. One night, they were doing just that. That night, their friend named Kayla Borza met up with the two and heard a pretty disturbing tale. Apparently, the two women were repeatedly being creeped out by a man staying at the campsite next to theirs. They didn't really say what the man was doing specifically that was skeeving them out, but it really did seem to be bothering them. That night, they decided to make the best of the situation and just head back to their campsite. Nobody left the bar with them. They headed back themselves. Days went by, three days to be exact, without anyone hearing from the couple. Even though they were out camping in the wilderness, it wasn't like them to lose contact for so long, even more than one day most of the time. This started to worry Kylan's dad, living away in Montana, who called a friend of the couple, Cindy Sue Hunter, and asked if she could go out and check on the two. Cindy said, He said, I just found out there was a creeper dude that they were scared of, that they needed to move their camp. All of a sudden, I had a sense of urgency. Cindy went out to the campground and started searching for their campsite. It didn't take long before she found it. She started searching the area while on the phone with Kylan's father, relaying to him what she was seeing. The place seemed ransacked, but the two weren't there. Cindy walked down to a small gulch where she came across a horrible discovery, the bodies of her two friends. She couldn't bring herself to really inspect them, understandably, and quickly turned away. Then I saw her body and I turned away, she said. I think something inside me didn't want to acknowledge what I had seen, so I was looking at the beauty of the creek and everything and talking to the father the whole time. I turned around again to make myself see, and it was her. I felt that Crystal was further south and that she had been brutalized more than Kylan. It's just a feeling I have. She added, her arms and legs were at an awkward angle and I went into shock in that moment. Cindy, fearing for her life and feeling as if the killer might still be nearby, left the area as quickly as she could and called the police, preferring to let them handle the scene. The police came out to the area to find the pair lying dead near a creek fairly close to their campsite. Both of them were partially undressed, all clothes removed from the waist down and covered in gunshot wounds. The wounds were covering their backs, sides, and chests. The police combed the campground, picking through the site for several days. They found all of the usual items that one might find at a camp, with one single tent and a rabbit shelter. 
The more important findings were all of the shell casings nearby, and there were a lot of them. Bullet fragments littered the whole site along with a good amount of blood. The medical examiner quickly determined that, to nobody's surprise, the gunshot wounds were the cause of death. More surprisingly, they found that there was no sign of sexual assault on either of the victims, despite their state of undress. This, understandably, did nothing but confuse those who were following the case. The investigators were able to determine that the two were killed by a 9mm Glock. On the day that they died, a certain vehicle was seen driving away from their campsite. It wasn't the typical sort of off-road camping vehicle, raising a bit of suspicion, but they weren't able to determine who owned the car. The killings left the people in this small, rural Utah community pretty paranoid. After all, there was a killer on the loose and nobody had any idea who it might be. Locals even felt that the police were trying to keep news about the crimes as quiet as possible. Cindy, the friend who discovered the two victims, said, How are we safe if you have a double homicide? You don't have a suspect in custody. You're not claiming it was a murder-suicide, so how are we possibly safe? It honestly feels like they're just trying to protect the tourism industry in Moab. The police did release a statement saying, At this time, the Grand County Sheriff's Office is conducting an ongoing homicide investigation, adding that they felt there is no current danger to the public in the Grand County area. The Sheriff's Office went on to tell local news outlets, we are currently following up with what comes to our attention during this investigation and will continue to be available to people to come forward with information. With no killer being found, people began to question as to whether or not the whole thing might have been some sort of murder-suicide, but Cindy said that she believed that this was not the case. They were murdered. They were shot. Neither one of them deserved this. They were good people. They were wonderful people and I love them and my heart is broken and I'm struggling. I don't know how to navigate through this. Kylan's aunt started a GoFundMe page to get some funds together and help their families out. People did what they could, and the donations ended up climbing to well over $30,000. A local business owner in Grand County even put together a reward of $10,000 himself for any information leading to the arrest of the killer. A second private citizen matched that, offering up their own $10,000 reward in addition. A candlelight vigil was held for the two victims on August 31st, where community members came together to pass out flowers and light lanterns for the two at their previous workplace, the Moonflower Community Cooperative. Kylan was buried next to her brother at Yellowstone Valley Memorial Park in Billings. Kylan's father had now lost both of his kids to violence. Crystal's mother, who didn't have access to the internet, wasn't informed of the crime until much later. She was in disbelief as to what had happened to the two. I went to my knees. <laughs> um, I don't know. I couldn't function too well after that. Police seized the two cars of the victims in order to search them. With a warrant, they were able to come up with all sorts of odds and ends from one of the cars. They came up with a journal, a Bible, a newspaper, clippings, mail, pay stubs, handwritten memos, and then some paperwork for a storage locker. The police went ahead and searched this locker as well, but they didn't come up with anything beneficial. Still having basically no information to go off of, the police obtained a warrant to search into a local cell tower. They were interested in obtaining information relating to the day surrounding the murders. The police did come across one man near the day of the murder, a man so unnerving that, when the police pulled him over, they refrained from giving him a speeding ticket as they felt they shouldn't keep their eyes off of him. They said he was so unnerving that the veteran law enforcement officer decided not to write the speeding ticket because he did not want to take his eyes off of him. Later on, when investigators interviewed the man, he told deputies he had seen the couple before and that he did not kill them, but he was not able to account for his whereabouts and would answer questions in non-committal ways. Eventually, deputies found a jacket that may have blood evidence on it around the area where this man said he was sleeping. The public was excited to hear that this may at least be a suspect, but it seemed that this man was ultimately ruled out when it was discovered that he couldn't have possibly been present at the time. Kylan's father, Sean Paul Schultz, decided it was time to pack up his bags and head out to Utah. If no suspect was going to turn up in the traditional way, he was determined to find a way to make it happen himself. He admittedly didn't know what he was going to do once he got there, but he had to do something. Sean Paul set up what he called a clue booth out in Moab, asking anyone who might have any information relating to the case, significant or not, to come forward and tell him what they knew. Over the course of a month, he got over 50 clues that he was able to turn over to the police. 
He said that only a handful of these clues weren't very useful and that most of what he heard was actually valuable information. In Sean Paul's own words, there were multiple leads, all involving what he called multiple creeps and weirdos. He had heard some worrying news from some of the locals that there might have been some pretty anti-lesbian people camping out in the area at the time. Hell, there were even some straight-up anti-human people in the area, the kind of people that would be unsafe for anyone of any kind to camp next to. My competent law enforcement, yeah, I don't think they're going to call me today, but that's only because I've been holding my breath for six months. Do I want to let my breath out? Hell yeah. Do I want to go in there and... and and give everyone in that sheriff's office a big hug and take them all out to dinner? Hell yeah, I want to. But I'm still holding my breath over here. Moved by this case, a private investigator named Jason Jensen contacted Sean Paul and offered to work on this case for free. Jensen asked him for all of his notes, then told him that he could go home and rest, giving the grieving father a much-needed break. Jason Jensen came on to a TV interview in which he detailed that the police had an audio recording of the shooting that day. The audio reportedly contained distant gunshots and screams, recorded from a drone that day. Jensen wasn't the only person who decided to come take on the case. Of all people, Dog the Bounty Hunter himself came out to Moab to talk about the murders, doing his own search for clues in the case. Dog got a slew of his own tips related to the murder and came to believe that the killer had to have been a local, someone who very well could still be nearby. Well, it's a hate crime. Exactly what we figured now that we've checked out our suspect has absolutely got a record of hating people like that. So uh, we believe it's a hate crime. It had to be either over love or hate. You just don't, a passerby just doesn't shoot two women six times apiece. Whoever did it and our suspect knows them. The police came to reveal that they had multiple potential suspects, actually. They didn't have anyone that really stood out as a definite candidate for the killer, though. As much as they looked into these people, nobody really seemed to fit the bill. Some people began to theorize that this case might have been linked to other missing persons cases in the Utah, Montana area. One case that people felt must be related was one of Brian Laundrie, who strangled his girlfriend Gabby in the area of Moab around the same time. On the internet, the cases became linked together at the time, with it being very hard to find mentions of one case without the other. Despite the location and time adding up, the cases weren't actually related at all. Things went quiet for a while, until May of 2022. This was when the police dropped a bombshell of a revelation in the case. They believed that they found the killer, without a doubt, and this killer was already dead. The Grand County Sheriff's Office has identified 44-year-old Adam Pinkowitz as a suspect in the murders of Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner. Police, after doing their due diligence, came to learn that one of the victims worked at McDonald's with a man named Adam Pinkusiewicz, a very angry man who wasn't seen as the best worker. Adam had only been in the area for a few months, living the van life. He had no address of his own, often parking at campsites in his van and living his life there. The sheriff's office had learned that Mr. Pinkowitz was in the LaSalle's and Moab at the time of the homicides and had left the state of Utah shortly after the homicides. You may be thinking, a disgruntled former co-worker who lived at campsites? How wasn't it obvious that this man was involved? Well, that's the strange thing. It didn't seem that Adam ever actually interacted with either Kylan or Crystal. In fact, it seemed that they worked very different shifts most of the time. It turns out that Adam was indeed one of the multiple persons of interest in the case, but the police didn't really have enough evidence to fully link him to the crime. You might wonder if Adam was indeed the local who hated lesbians. Well, a surprising twist was that Adam was gay himself, so it wasn't likely that this was a factor in the murders. Police, struggling to find any sort of motive, could only come up with one possible negative interaction between the two. Kylan, apparently, had once asked Adam to leave her alone when she came into the kitchen to grab some food. This was something that angered him greatly, and he went on to complain to the manager. He then went on to complain to other co-workers that she was getting food while she wasn't even scheduled, something that he found... immoral? Given that they didn't even work the same shift, and that everyone was wearing masks during COVID, it's believed that Kylan didn't even recognize Adam or know who he was at the time. To her, this was just some strange man who was chewing her out while she was grabbing some food. 
One even more confusing aspect of this case is that it seems that Adam more frequently had negative interactions with other co-workers. In fact, after being told by the manager to work faster, he reportedly threatened to kick her ass. This manager opted to switch out and let another manager handle him. It's safe to say that he wasn't very well liked at his workplace. Adam was eventually fired in the end. It's believed that he killed Kylan and Crystal shortly after, never coming in to pick up his final paycheck. Instead, he disappeared. The police, wanting to investigate Adam, came to find out that he was already gone. Permanently. On September 24th of 2021, months prior, he had ended his own life in a motel room. The police came to find one person who could confirm that, in all likelihood, Adam had killed the two, Adam's ex-lover. Apparently, Adam had driven out to Iowa to speak to this man, where he confessed to everything. This was after confiding in his ex that he had an ongoing impulse inside him to kill, something that likely scared him off and played a big part in their separation. Adam revealed the motive behind the killings to only this man, that Kylan had been, in his own words, bossy to him one day. That was all. That was the reason he killed the two. This ex-partner, feeling that Adam could easily come back and kill him too, didn't go to the police with what he knew. The cops tracked him down themselves and went out to speak to him. As soon as they showed up, he said that he knew what it must have been about. Once he came to learn that Adam was already dead, he no longer had any reason to hold back and told them everything. The police searched Adam's phone, in which they found all manner of alarming red flags. They said that he, in addition to his already apparent anger problem, showed extreme signs of racism and repeatedly fantasized about rape and murder. He would even stalk people by writing down their license plate numbers for later reference. Months before the killings, he wrote, I'm afraid I have an ongoing impulse in me to kill or rape people. I overworked myself and that's caused me to feel bad and think negative evil thoughts and this doesn't define me or say who I am. And I can say it another way redundantly if I wish. I'm a free person. He deleted most of the content from his life during his time in Moab and even downloaded an encryption app. But even so, there was more than enough evidence left behind. I can't believe I picked up a clue on Adam Pincus in my clue booth in the park. I cannot believe it. The only other thing I can say is that I hope they can process the evidence and close the case. Sean Paul Schultz was overjoyed to hear that finally the police had found their killer. He told a court TV reporter, We did it. Thank you. Reminiscing about all the people who came out to help him find information, like Jason Jensen and Dog the Bounty Hunter. The police say that if Adam Pinkusiewicz was still alive, they would have more than enough evidence to convict him in this case. Sean Paul Schultz is satisfied with this ending, saying, I don't have to face him in court. He's already been sentenced to hell. The girls are now resting in peace, and I am already starting to heal. Them closing the case with such uh, a plethora of evidence is worth celebrating. I'm excited to start start my life again. One thing after another just built up to this really super euphoric feeling of just elation. Once again, thank you for watching my video. If you found it interesting, please give it a like as it really helps me out in the algorithm and feel free to subscribe if you want to see more content like this. Go ahead and follow me on social media if you want. I mean, you never know what will happen to a channel like this. If you want to support me even further and help me out, I do have a Patreon account which I always keep linked down in the description below. There you can see videos early, ad-free, and uncensored. Speaking of which, shout out to the top patrons. We have Rabid Snarf, Royal Pain and Ass, Kylie Jeffers, Tracy Farrell, Jada, Dana Hart, Anna B, Sunrider, Lee aka Crust, Emilia Morales, George Lopez, Minnie Tina, Ron Murillo, Kimmy Leffel, Melina Lee Williams Haas, Impalato, Stephen Jamie Kramer, Max Sword Guy, Pao Yang, April Diamond, Starfade, Angie, Rick of Work in Progress USA, Sass Johnson, Marianne McCurdy, Buttery Frankus, Jules Latona, Arctic Cat, Adrian Lawley, Marsh, Rinsenstein, Kim Peek, Lex Luthor, Lux Alpaca, CSD, Scoochie Main, Jackie, and Mark Barnett. You all have names, and I read those names. This has been your host, Kyle. Thank you, and good night.